For those of you who are new, uh, we're really excited to have you. Um, feel free to share in the comments um, what you're expecting to learn or where you're coming from or a little bit about your experience. Um, I tend to start at seven minutes past the hour to give people uh, some time to come in. And so in that time, I might read some of those responses in the chat and talk a little bit about those. Um, it also helps me um, stress certain things that I may or may not stress in the discussion. So that way um, I tell you things that you're interested in um, as well as the things that I think are uh, interesting and relevant. Zach, is there anything that you're expecting to learn or something that you think will uh, be interesting? Yeah, I mean, um, <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm so fascinated uh, with the obviously, you know, First World War and Second World War, but the um, uh, the Middle East is kind of, it's a black box for me, right? I mean, I know from the society of um, Western society, you know, obviously Russia coming from Uzbekistan. I know a lot that was happening during World War II and the Civil War in Russia uh, and the uh, Lenin Accord and whatnot, you know, Brest-Litovsk agreement and stuff like that. But I don't know a lot about Middle East and the yeah. World War. No, it might be surprising that Brest-Litovsk actually had an effect in the Middle East. Uh, and so I plan to cover that in the presentation. Um, I have one note from uh, from Sherry. Thank you so much for joining, Sherry. Um, and uh, I hope that uh, my lesson is as good as you would prepare for your middle school social studies curriculum. Um, it might be a, go a little bit uh, more in depth, um, but that is uh, that is uh, hopefully it meets up with your standards. Hi, Zach. Hi, Richard. Thanks for hosting us. Oh no, my pleasure. Please always invite, uh, always invite your friends. The more the merrier. And uh, you know me, I love questions. Um, so uh, I don't know how in, uh, familiar your guests are with interactive material, but um, I do read the comments. So if they have questions, comments, clarifications, um, I respond to the chat in real time while I'm doing my presentation. Um, so they should feel that it's a place where um, they can ask the questions that they think are interesting, uh, even while I'm giving the presentation. Okay, no problem. Yeah, I would guess there's probably a few people here that have not been on one of your fabulous programs before. And um, the only reason I haven't been here is I've been tied up with work, but getting more free time now. So look <laughs> forward to seeing you. And I'll be here next week also. Fantastic. Um, yeah, uh, the, we're getting into a very interesting period of time. 1910 to about 1925 was a moment of real change in the Middle East, like substantive um, changes that completely altered the way the Middle East would be going from, because the Middle East really hadn't changed from about 1517 when the Ottomans became the dominant power. And I mean, we did do about 20 episodes about what that looked like. So... <laughs> It's kind of silly for me to say that nothing changed, but this was such a monumental change in such little amount of time that uh, that these uh, these episodes coming up are going to be really exciting. So we're happy to have you, Robert. Um, I have a comment from Chris um, talking about uh, how this is not a widely covered subject regarding World War One, and that's also kind of why I wanted to do it. Um, I think that, and I will talk about a little bit what happens in Europe, but. One of the funniest things I always thought about World War One was that, right, the cause of the war is the assassination of an Austrian archduke in southern Slavic territory, right? It's the modern country of Bosnia, but it was by Serb nationalists. Um, and nobody can tell you what happened to Serbia and Austria after that, right? That, that was the center of the war. That was the cause of the war. But uh, very few people can actually tell you what happened to Serbia. Um, so yeah, so that's the part that I'm going to talk about. In fact, I don't think I'm going to mention the United States pretty much at all today, except, uh, some comments about Woodrow Wilson, um, because the United States wasn't really involved in the Middle Eastern theater, which is kind of strange to say, um, given how involved the United States has become since, uh, World War II. Uh, but at this point in time, the United States really focused on the Western front. Hi, Mark. Good to see you. Same here. I, I didn't want to miss this one. Yeah, fantastic. I'm, I'm curious. 
Uh, before I start in about a few minutes, was there anything that you were really looking forward to seeing, interested about, um, as concerns sort of this time period? Uh, well, I guess one would be so how surprised, because um, the Ottoman Empire had been the sick man of Europe for what, three, four, five decades before this. Yet they turned it around you know, on the on, on the Caucasian front against the Russians, um, with the, the British in Mesopotamia and the siege of Kut and and Gallipoli, though in the end they lost when the British came out of Egypt. But they did, you know, 10 times better than anyone would have expected, including the minorities. They had, you know, they had I know they had uh, for a fact they had Armenians fighting in Gallipoli um, yeah. and, Kur and Kurds. Um, how you know it's like if they were able to muster all that willpower why did it fall apart I mean, it's, it's kind of a, a big a very kind of meta question but yeah, yeah um the sick man of europe was western correspondence about the ottoman empire it really didn't reflect what was going on inside the ottoman empire as you know because you've seen several of these episodes the ottoman empire was an incredibly vibrant place through much of the 19th century um and um the biggest issue was really holding the empire together as many of the minorities wanted to break off Oh, well, that's so, true. There was they. they uh, I'm sorry. Wait, 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 wait. Yeah, they did. They didn't do very well against the Russians in 1877, 78, but they they kind of held their own in a sense. I mean, they fought well, but lost. Right. Right. Exactly. Now, the Ottoman Empire's uh, military in 1877 was better than the Ottoman military in terms of modernization had been at any other time. Um, basically, since Suleiman the Magnificent, right, in terms of how modern his army was relative to what uh, was surrounding him. Yeah. Um, it just happened that the Ottomans didn't have as many soldiers and they didn't have as many training academies and all these kinds of things. Um, there's a question, will I be talking about Lawrence of Arabia? I should do. Um, I definitely have that on my agenda. Uh, hopefully we'll get there. Um, but as for the Ottoman Empire, the Ottoman Empire really does punch above its weight in the First World War. Um, we're going to talk about the populations and the Ottoman Empire's population is much lower uh, than we would expect. Um, and so the British actually thought, much like your question presupposed, that the Ottoman Empire would be just sort of a pushover. Uh, but Gallipoli and Kudal Amara, as we'll talk about, basically uh, show that the Ottoman Empire did have quite a bit of fight in it. Um, and it wasn't going to be as easy as the British surmised. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it, it was also um, their own fault for overreach. It was, I mean, they were, they, they didn't have the experience in the amphibious operations. They didn't have good maps. I mean, all sorts of things. That's absolutely true. 